Welcome back to the drawing board with me Stephen Lloyd and today we'll be talking about forces versus stresses and then about plastic versus elastic stress distributions. Um, I'm going to start with something a little bit unrelated but it becomes quite important later on. Motion systems is usually what we think of when we're talking about forces being applied to an object, about rigid body movement. So you have an object in space, you apply a force and it accelerates. F equals MA, Newton's laws of motion. It's what empirically we all recognise that you push something with a force and it makes it move. So we all seem to intrinsically understand that force causes motion. But I want to talk more about static systems and generally when you're talking about structures and engineering you're not interested in a force making a movement, what you're interested in is in things staying still. So you may induce a deflection, for instance on a rigid post, and there is a force applied to it, but think about it the other way around. By causing that thing to move, it causes a stress and a force to be generated within the object itself. So rather than thinking force makes motion, start thinking about inducing a movement will generate stress. Flip it the other way around. So that's not quite important just yet, but it will become important later on as we start to discuss spring models and stress distributions. So we talked in the last drawing board, which is about analytical models, of how to produce a model and the difference between simplifying some stress distributions into forces and actions. And I'm going to flip it around again this time, where rather than looking at simple forces and actions, we're going to look at how the stress distribution affects the way you may produce a design. So in this example on the left, we have a cantilever sticking out of a wall, so it may be a post or a shelf or some kind of hanging bracket, and it's taking a force at the end. To resist that, we need an equal vertical upward resistance, which will come in the form of shear, but we also need to stop it turning so there'll be a moment. The way that's generated in reality is that there are shear forces running all the way through this beam equally along it. The particles to the left hand side are holding up the particles on their right and the particles on their left hand side are holding those ones up and so on and so forth. But how the moment is generated is that there is a tension at the top of the beam and a compression at the bottom and it's large at the edge because that's the part that is moving the most and we'll come on to this spring model later on to demonstrate how more movement will generate more stress. So we're back to this idea, flipping it round, movement makes stress, not force making movement. So I've got an example here of a bracket that may be bolted or glued to the ceiling, let's say. With these sets of bolts, and we have an offset force, it's slightly over to this side, I think everyone can naturally assume that because the force is more over this way, the bolts at this side will be doing a little bit more work. You'll have a high stress here and a low stress over that side. With the case of it being glued or welded to the ceiling, you would have stress distribution continuously but gradually rising towards this side. And the difference between the bolts with three forces and the stress distribution sort of continuous along it is that these forces here basically represent if you condensed those stresses down into that one point where the bolt is. So there isn't really that much difference between force and stress, it's just we often use force to simplify and to condense the stress down into one point. And it lets us work out, for instance, a bolt, you will usually be quoted an ultimate tensile strength, and rather than having all these stresses, we condense it into a force, and we know if that force is smaller than the strength of the bolt, the thing will work. Bolts usually come in groups, you tend not to use one on its own and this is a really important thing and why I use this as the example for the spring model. Not only do you have to work out if one bolt is strong enough to take the force that's applied to it, you have to work out if those forces can actually be equally spread or fairly evenly spread across all of the bolts in the group. There's no point in having bolts that are really strong and can take with the sum of six bolts the whole force if only one of those bolts is ever working at any given time because what you end up there is a progressive failure where once one bolt fails the next bolt fails the next bolt fails so if each bolt individually can take the load of its equal share but can't actually share them out equally there's no point in using those bolts in that design so this is this spring model that I use the reason this spring at this side moves more is because we have this offset force that I've showed you here these springs will move more and they will generate more and more stress, more force as well, as they move more. What you have to make sure is that 
this spring will allow that movement to happen, that will allow the next bolt to begin moving, that will allow the next bolt to begin moving, and that that movement can occur before the failure of the bolt occurs. So the way I think about this is like if you're doing a bungee jump. Uh, you have a bungee cable that you know can take a ton of weight, and I weigh 80 kilos, so I know that this bungee cable isn't going to break. But what's really important isn't the force it can take, but whether it will be able to apply that force to me and stop me before it hits the ground. There's no point in the bungee cable not snapping if I've already hit the ground before it starts to pull back on me. And here's our stress strain curve. This should be familiar to most engineers. You get an elastic stress here where as the strain increases, the stress increases uh, proportionally to that. This is the plastic part where you can continue to move the element and it will stretch applying the same force no matter how much more you stretch it up to a point where it fails. This is the important part where we want the first bolt that begins taking some load to either not reach this point of failure or the steel to act a little bit plastically and this is where we begin to get onto plastic distributions especially when you're talking about compact steel beams where parts of the steel have reached this area here and have continued to stretch but as they continue to stretch it allows other elements to climb this curve and begin to add more resistance to begin to help more and more. I use this velcro example uh, to demonstrate that, to demonstrate how depending on which direction force is acting and depending on how much movement is allowed to occur you can get the stresses either causing a progressive failure or the stress has been shared fairly well. So if you try and apply a shear force to a piece of velcro, so you've got two bits of velcro stuck together and you try and separate them sideways you are engaging every single hook and hoop on this velcro all the way along and you won't be able to pull them apart. How you pull them apart is you grab one end and you peel it. This is your progressive failure. You're applying the stress just to that first set of hook and hoops on the Velcro. Just like here, we might only be applying the force to that first bolt. And this will fail because that small force will tear a couple of these, the next couple will fail, the next couple, and it will progressively fail all the way through. How do we fix that? How do we stop this Velcro from tearing apart? Two ways. We could stiffen the backing of the Velcro so that even when you pull them apart, everything moves together as one rigid body and you're having to pull every single hook and hoop at the same time. Or we can create a situation in which these hook and hoop will remain engaged even though you're pulling them apart. And so as these ones begin to stretch, it will begin to engage the next ones and the next ones. And that is how you compare an elastic to a plastic stress model in a steel beam. We mentioned progressive failure and that's something I will talk about in the next episode where we'll be talking more about sort of house of cards and domino effect uh, of progressive failures. So I hope you'll come back to the drawing board and have a look at progressive failures with me.